Welcome to day 475, final words. Today is a 24 minute video interview with Angie Bourdain, filmed by Fast Company, which was a magazine I used to read. Um, this interview is six months before Anthony Bourdain's suicide. So this is their last interview, not his last interview. Their last interview with him. And now that we know what is going to happen six months from now, six months from the video, you listen a little bit more closely to the words that he says. And um, it's much sadder, you know, thinking about it. Because he talks about his past with drug use, depression, things like that. And he talks about how good he has it, about his level of excellence and quality. And you think the guy has everything he wants. He goes, I make, the sh I make the shows I want. I can do anything I want. I can travel anywhere in the world. I can't believe I'm living this life. And then six months later, he commits suicide. This is incredibly heartbreaking if you let it be. Or you can reminisce on it and say, okay, what are the lessons um, I learned? And through that lens is how I want to talk about this um, the lesson so tip number one is this when you're watching the video Anthony Bourdain's mic'd up but the interviewer is not and she's off camera and so they have to write in because she's hard to hear they type in her question and comments and the first time I watched it I was, I was annoyed because you hear all these things like sounds in the background like clack 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 and you're like, what the hell's going on? And the first, and then I finally realized people, they're putting away their lighting equipment and sound equipment and all their wires and stuff. So tip number, so it becomes clear that they're doing this interview while they're breaking down the set. So tip number one is this, never pass on an opportunity. So the only time that Fast Company was going to be able to interview Anthony Bourdain was while his crew was breaking down the set for whatever it was they were filming, okay? And you could easily say, well, we don't want to get in your way, et cetera, et cetera. But never pass up the opportunity. I'll give you a personal example. So who remembers Someone's at my front door. There's nobody good at coming in my front door. All right, so who remembers um, Mark Eaton, basketball player? He's like seven foot four, center for the Utah Jazz. He's a Utah Jazz basketball player legend, Mark Eaton. So a year ago, when I was actually last February, a year, year and a half ago almost, when this whole thing started, <clears throat> we were in Utah doing the Utah experience and the Utah Jazz. This was right before NBA shut down because of coronavirus. And Mark Eaton was there and he spoke to us and he kind of shared his philosophies on life and everything. And we got to shoot basketballs on the basketball court of the Utah Jazz after the game. We we're having a good time. And uh, Mark Eaton was there taking photographs of everybody. If you've never seen a seven foot tall person, it's kind of crazy. Everybody wants to take a picture with him. So all these people are taking pictures with him. And I I was like too cool for school. And I was like, that's okay. I don't need to take a picture with Mark Eaton. Uh, I'm sure I'll see him later, you know, uh, and we'll do it later. Fast forward a year and a half, Mark Eaton last month died. He died while um, riding his bike, in a mountain bike. Of, I can't imagine how big a mountain bike would have to be to fit a seven foot four person, but um, he went out for a bike and then never made it home. I think he had a mass, I think, I think he had a heart attack. <clears throat> but now I don't have a picture of Mark Eaton. Passed up on the opportunity. So tip number one is don't pass up on the opportunity. When, when you have it, take it. That's really super important. Tip number two. In this video, Anthony Bourdain says, you know, he, he really abhors like ordinary production work, film, um, 
you know, commonplace work. And he says, it's like porn. <laughs> you know all the words, you know all the lines, you know all the angles, you know all the steps of making a porn movie, and it's just pedestrian. He says it's very boring and he doesn't want to do that. My tip number two for you is this. Most people live life like it's porn. By that I mean not doing porn, not nothing sexy like that, but it's very pedestrian. You know what's going to happen. You already know your schedule. You know your role. You know the outcome. <laughs> you know how the <laughs> how it's all going to end. And but that's how they live their life. They go to a nine to five job that's not going to you know get them anywhere. They're kind of making horizontal promotions. They don't really have a script. They have Monday through Friday that. You know, oh boo, it's Monday, hump day, Wednesday, TJIF Friday. Oh yay, it's the weekend. And then Sunday's like, where happened to my weekend? Where did it go? I can't believe it's fucking Monday again. And they do this over and over and over again. They'll do first day of kindergarten, first day of first grade, first day, last day of second grade. I can't believe she's headed a freshman in high school. Oh my God, you know, he's got his driver's license. Oh, I'm so sad, he's graduating college. Congratulations, he got into Harvard. Can't believe he's got graduated Harvard. Can't believe he's in med school, I'm so proud of my kid. You know, oh boo, I'm getting a divorce. Oh, I found a new guy, I got a new job. It's very pedestrian. And then one day you wake up and you're like, how the fuck did I turn 49, you know? When did that happen? Because he's like, Daddy, can you take me, uh, teach me how to drive a car? I'm like, you're cheating. I'm going to learn how to drive a car. She's like, no, I'm turning 15. I was like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> you know? And I've had a very good life. I mean, I've had highs and lows in real estate, losing everything losing my family, starting all over, building back up and retiring at 45 and growing this tribe and somebody's here. Oh, I think it's the best guy. It's like the best guy. 40, you know, like, and then growing this tribe for the last uh, year and a half and with no signs of stopping, I just really want to keep going with this, you know? And, um, and then my own personal development from being in group with you guys and looking at my numbers and trying to find out what I want to do and, you know, who remembers this time last year? I was like, I had that aha moment with y'all on camera where I said, it's my honor and my privilege to bring Erica a cup of coffee because if I don't do it, then some other guy's going to do it and I don't fucking want that. So who remembers that? And I'll, and sometimes I was going long, and you guys would go, you better go get Erica her cup of coffee. And I was like, oh yeah, you know, it's my honor, my privilege. I quit getting bothered that she wasn't getting up early like I wanted her to, because getting up early will change her life. But I can't think that way. I needed to think it's my honor and privilege to bring her coffee. I'm gonna kill my nose, I can't believe this. No, I love my nose. My nose is awesome. It's doing its job. <laughs> so, the last thing I want is a common everyday life. Like I know, I know what to expect. Let me give you a couple more. Uh, two weeks of vacation. You get two weeks of paid vacation. Oh, that's awesome, amazing. I would tell you why, why, why only two weeks, why, and you can't take them together, they're one week at a time, you can't take two weeks together, so you think that's so cool that you, you get to have paid vacation for two weeks, like why, how, like, you've been brainwashed, I have a 401k, what does that mean, it's got matching, so how much do they match? Like everything you put in? No, up to 4%. Up to 4%? So how much is that? I don't even know. I don't even really know what that, that means. So basically, instead of the money 
going into your bank account so that you can do what the fuck you want to do with it, whether it's spend it or invest it with Chris Noggle or invest it with Dr. V, you are, they are taking it out of your paycheck and putting it in their chosen account, Fidelity, which you might might or might not like, might have high fees, you don't know. And they're gonna match it 4% maybe, and they're, they're actually comment if your employer is starting to, to get it, to take it away. Like they aren't even doing their matching. It's like they're decreasing their matching, right? And and they're basically saying, we don't trust you with your own money, so we're going to force you. This is Social Security, by the way. We're going to force you to, to save. And somehow we think, like, oh, I have a 401k. That's great. I have two weeks of vacation. That's amazing. Oh, so the other 50 weeks, like, you've got to work? Like, I can go on fucking vacation whenever I want. How is that so good? Yeah, but Dr. V, you're Dr. V. Like, well, I didn't become Dr. V overnight. I had to work it, right? I just chose to think of the world in a different light. Okay, let me do the next number. Next tip, he abhors pedestrian work. He, ab he hated commonplace things. Like he wanted to be extraordinary. So tip number three is this. See, most people go through their life just looking at the, at the clock, looking at I can't wait for the, the buzzer to go off. To I can leave work. Then I'll live my life. And Anthony Bourdain says, no. Like, I want to do exceptional work. I want to try hard. I want to do great work. I want to be remembered for something. And I was like, that's right, motherfucker. That's why you're Anthony fucking Bourdain, man. Because you weren't like any other TV show. You know, if you ever watched... No reservations or uh, parts unknown is fantastic. And he would explore these weird parts of the world. He would eat whatever fucking crazy ass shit they put in front of him. And, um, and, and, uh, he would stay up all night and drink and whatever they, they, he, I mean, there were things like he, they were like, they took me to a nightclub and I was there all night. We were drinking and they filmed the whole crew filmed it and stuff. The video the other day, Eric Repair says, you know, there's this one scene where you're in India and they cut out the heart of a cobra, live cobra, and they give it to you to eat. And he goes, you ate it. Why did you eat it? Were you trying to do shock there? Like, were you trying to be shocking? And Anthony Bourdain had a very good answer. He said, he said, I, ex I ate the cobra heart because... I could not believe that someone was paying me to live the life of my dreams. And at any moment, this could go away. And if I ate the cobra heart, maybe in the future, I would have this great story to tell at a bar and maybe someone would buy me a drink. <laughs> you know, you have this great story to tell that maybe somebody would buy you a drink to hear it. This could all go away. You know, when I became director of bariatrics in Albuquerque, I was like, very clear. We have to be different. A lot of y'all don't know, but um, New Mexico has a checkered past with bariatric surgery. There was a very like, well-respected surgeon at the University of New Mexico, apparently a good surgeon who was way before my time. This was around 2000. And um, he was um, very well respected. He started um, trying to do bariatric surgery, weight loss surgery, laparoscopic bypasses, things like that. And he had some very bad outcomes and some patients were dying. I actually had one patient in my clinic said, I was on, I was actually in the holding room waiting for my bariatric surgery back in 2001 or 2002, when they came in and said, I'm so sorry, um, we've canceled your surgery. And they'll be, they shut down the program that day. She was gonna be the next patient in line. And he had another bad outcome. Because there's this learning curve, right? You have, he wasn't a bad surgeon, it's just a learning curve back then, 2000. 
And he just had too many bad outcomes. And so they um, closed down his program. It ended up being a bunch of lawsuits. A lot of lawyers got very wealthy uh, on the back of that surgeon. He eventually left UNM. I think he went to another hospital, but um, shortly thereafter, I think he, he retired. I mean, it was just, you know, broke his heart. But, um, why was I telling you all that? Oh, so when I, so when I came to Albuquerque, I had this very clear vision of the, um, what had happened, why it was being slow to adopt. And this is 2013, 13 years later, they're still very apprehensive. So I said, we're going to do something great, right? And we're not going to take on the hardest, most difficult patients. We're not doing now Zardin stuff who I know Dr. Now and the 600 pound life. And that's the conception people had that people are like, Oh my God, he's going to do like these massive fat people stuff. And I said, no, we're going to have a very controlled, um, standards and we are going to really focus on the educational component. And I went all obnoxious. Like I wasn't doing pedestrian stuff and not, not to say the, the other, my competitors were very good surgeons but they just kind of did the usual program that in 2013 and to this day still most average programs do which is minimal education minimal support and i and i said we are going to go heavy into education we are going to go heavy into support we were going to be the best and that's kind of what anthony bourdain is trying to tell you like i abhor pedestrian work like really do something amazing right really really decide i want y'all to really decide that you are going to take your bariatric surgery your weight loss journey and do something fucking magnificent with it you know get to fucking goal weight stop stop it with the i can't lose my 20 pounds of weight regain stop it with the you know i'm i'm stuck at 250. no you're not stuck because the second you say i'm stuck and you really if you really open up, you understand like I'm eating too many calories. I'm stuck at 300. No, you're not. You are just doing the behaviors that are keeping you at 300. You continue to think the same thoughts that has regained 20 pounds. That's the problem. So, what I want you to do is open up to this idea like I can be fabulous. I can get to goal weight. I can get fit. I can get strong. I, I can afford weight loss or um, I can afford skin removal. I need to repair my relationships. I need to get rid of negative relationships. I can do these things. I can make more money. You know, some people fell out of the chair when I showed them my numbers in group. I was like, this is what I'm spending. And they're like, what the fuck? You know? And, and I still have people on my fan page that are like, must be nice. You, motherfucker, you have people in your life that are saying, it must be nice. You know, you had Dr. V as your surgeon. You can afford the tribe. I tried to get you into the tribe when it was $19 a month. Why didn't you do it? Oh, I couldn't, he cost too much. That's your thinking. That's keeping you pedestrian. That's making you live this life of pornography. You know, the, you know the routines, you're comfortable. That's problematic, okay? That's very problematic. Don't be spraying in my garden. Okay, next tip. Anthony Bourdain says, you know, at any moment, this can be taken away from me. But I'm not scared because I know I can become a line cook. He had to do this. After he, he graduated Culinary Institute of America, went for the money, made a lot of money as a young chef, rising up in the ranks, got a drug habit, had to go to rehab, burnt all of his bridges, 
And once he got sober, he had to start all over again. He took any job that was available. He went from this top end chef to like nobody. And he had to start all over again. And at the age of 44, he was barely getting by. He wrote an article that was not being published and his mother had the hubris and the audacity to suggest that maybe they submit it to the New Yorker. The New Yorker ran the article. This lady read it and gave him the ridiculous amount of money, $50,000, to write a book. Which for him at that time, $50,000, he was barely getting by. He hadn't paid his credit cards. He wasn't paying his rent. He was barely eking by a living. So that's a ridiculous sum of money. He writes the book. It becomes a bestseller. And his life changes overnight at the age of 44. See, you're never too old to break free. Don't ever say, but this Dr. Reed, this is how I've always done it. No, it's easy for you. It's hard for me. Dude, Anthony Bourdain says, listen to me. He says, 44 years old, my life literally changed overnight. Dr. V would ask you to think about this. Did his life really change overnight? I don't think it did. I think he had to go through all of that stuff. It's like um, Hootie and the Blowfish, the band. They became an overnight sensation. And Hootie's like, yeah, overnight sensation 10 years in the making. They'd been doing tours and playing in shitty bars and nightclubs for 10 years before they made it big. So I would argue that Anthony Bourdain was an overnight success 20 years in the making. And he took that experience into this interview where he says, I'm okay because I can be a line cook if I have to. I can go back to working in a restaurant if I want to. I don't want to, but I'm willing. See, I don't want to go back to medicine, but I'm willing if I have to, if shit went crazy, if I lost it all, if something happened, I can always go back and pay for my licensure, and et cetera, et cetera, you know. See, people don't understand how licensure and medicine works. Like, I didn't lose my license. I didn't lose my medical degree. I just retired. And you have to pay every year. You have to do CMEs. You have to prove that you have this continuing education. You have, you have to show you have liability insurance and all this sort of stuff. Why would I pay for all that shit if I'm not using it, right? So you just let your licensure lapse. I didn't surrender it. It wasn't taken from me. I didn't lose it. I just left medicine. At any moment, I could reapply. I could reapply to New Mexico or any state and say, here are my degrees, here's where I went to med school, here's where I went to residency, you know, here's what I've been doing for the last seven years or eight years or 10 years. Um, and they would reinstate me on conditions, right? So the conditions would probably be, well, you haven't been practicing medicine, so you need someone to review your cases or operate with you or whatever, and that's fine. Now, why would they do that? Answer, it's very fucking expensive to train a doctor, especially a surgeon. So a doctor's one thing, but surgeons are a whole nother level of skill and training and, and investment and time. So they don't wanna lose that, and they know that surgeons, doctors and surgeons are huge economic drivers for the community, for the state, pay taxes, et cetera, and all that stuff. It's a whole engine around it. Hospitals are major employers for communities and stuff. So at any moment, if I wanted to, I could totally go back to medicine and I would be willing to. I don't want to. And I'm gonna work very hard 
to make sure I'm not doing pornography. Like I, in that, by that I mean I don't want to go back to living that nine to five life or sixty hour work, work weeks or seventy hour work weeks or I don't want to be on call. I don't want to have the pedestrian life of every like every surgeon. But I'm willing if I have to, right? So when you have that mindset and you've already done it and you've proven you've done it, you can kind of be audacious. You can go for it. I'll give you another example. What the fuck does that have to do with my weight loss surgery, Dr. V? You already know what it's like to be 300 pounds. You already know it sucks. You already know it hurts. Your knees hurt. You already know you can't fit into a roller coaster. You know you're getting older. You know it's harder to lose weight the older you get. You know that fat cells never go away. You know you have this knowledge, right? You know what it's like to be 300 pounds. Why would you go back to that? I know what it's like to be a surgeon. I know the hours. I know the expectations. I know the liability. I know the fucking chaos. Why would I go back to that? Why would you for any, any fucking cookie go, yeah, I'll risk being diabetic again. Why? Makes no sense. Because you had a stressful day? Because your fucking boss embarrassed you? Because your, your kid's on drugs? Because my kids are on drugs, I'm going to like stuff my face and I'm going to eat shit and I'm going to risk being a diabetic again. Really? People said when COVID broke out, Dr. V, why don't you go back and become a doctor and, and work in these IC? Like, what the fuck? Why the fuck would I want to do that? That's the last thing I want to do. You have this pandemic, you have this coronavirus, you, you've got this virus that you don't know what the long-term effects are, what the death rates are. It's not looking good. You don't really know how to treat patients. You're at fucking massive liability. And don't, don't fucking, don't think for a second that there aren't going to be massive lawsuits that come from um, this pandemic. There will be. We lost over, we lost 3,600 healthcare workers during the pandemic. And these idiots are like, Dr. V, why don't you man up and, and, go, and go practice medicine? Because that's what manning up means to you. I don't have to live by your fucking narrative. I know what I'm doing. I saved more lives by doing these COVID videos. I saved more lives by trying to convince people to wear masks and to, to stay at home. I did my share. How do you know, Dr. V? I know because I had friends who were surgeons. I have this one friend who's a really, really good bariatric surgeon in London. And when it got bad in the UK, he slept in a tent in his fucking front yard. And he waved to his kids. He has like a five-year-old son. Waved to his kid from the tent. Couldn't hug him, couldn't go in and see his wife. Didn't, could, it was early days. This is April of last year. You didn't know. We didn't know how contagious it was. So he was at the hospital. He changed clothes, showered in the hospital locker room, you know, went home, slept in a tent. Oh, why don't you go back to being a doctor? Why? Why would I do that? Why would you ever consider going back to 300 pounds? Oh, no, Dr. V, I wouldn't. Really? No, no, I wouldn't. Well, you were 170 two months ago. Now you're 180. Yeah, but I ain't ever getting to 190. Well, you were 180 three months ago, and now you're 190. Well, I ain't getting to 200. You're 199. Oh, yeah, but I'm not going to get to 200. You're 204 now. Yeah, yeah, but at least I haven't regained all my weight. At least I'm still down 150. Well, you used to be down 180. You know? Your bank account used to have $20,000 in it. Yeah, but it's better than zero. 
when are you gonna stop your Amazon shopping, your addiction, transfer addiction? Where are you gonna, when are you gonna like get serious? Right? Because everything that he said, Anthony Bourdain said in this video that was so eloquent and beautiful, six months later, he's dead. Six months later, he's dead. See, that's the thing about life. You don't know when your final words are. You don't know what you're going to say. You know? What happens if something happened to Erica and Mason in New Mexico and I never see them again? What happens if on my road trip to go pick them up, something happens to me and they never see me again? You just don't know. You don't know what your final words are going to be. So, day 475. I challenge you to decide right now. Dr. V is fucking right. What I am doing is keeping me at this weight. And whatever, every, everything that he says that fucking bugs me is what I need to do. Whenever he talks about money and it bugs me, that's what I need to focus on. When he talks about not snacking, and I want to say, but I'll die if I don't snack. That's what I need to do. And I need to stop saying, yeah, but. Yeah, but my knees hurt. Yeah, but you don't understand. I'm busy. Yeah, but. Yeah, but my, my husband has cancer. My kid's on drugs. My, yeah, but my grandmother moving in with us. What? Because you're the only one with that diagnosis? You're the only one who has a mom who is sick? You're the only one who was abused? No, you just haven't decided. Because you think, there's this, I don't know if it's real, but there's this meme going around that Buddha said, your biggest problem is you still think you have time. You still think you have time. You've been brainwashed to think that I am going to retire at 65. And everywhere fucking around you right now, all of these baby boomers who bought into the fact, into this story that they were going to work their whole lives and then be able to retire at 65, everybody around you, they're starting to realize, I cannot retire at 65. I don't have enough money. But somehow you, you're 50, you still have time to figure it out. Money's not that important. You don't have to do this. You can, you can keep buying your toys and your Peloton and your shit and do, you know, spend it on this and that. But you don't want to sit down and figure out your financial freedom number. Right. You still think it's awesome to be told you can get off, you have two weeks of vacation. And every time you go, okay, I want that vacation week. I want that week on vacation. Oh, no, you can't do that. Why not? Sally in accounting already took that week. This girl already took it. We can't have two people out at the same time. But I thought I could have two weeks of vacation. Oh, yeah, but it has to work within the system. You know? It's still not your time. Oh, but at least they paid me for it. Did they? Did they pay you for it? Or is this this thing called this PTO thing? Use it or lose it. Used to be if you had paid time off, you could turn it back in for 100% of the value. Now you could turn it back in for 50% of the value. Now if you're quitting your job, they'll give you 30% of your value. Or now you don't spend it, you lose it. So people are like, here's my two weeks notice. I'm taking my two weeks of PTO. Bye. See, the system is rigged against you. Oh, but at least I own my house, Dr. V. I don't have a mortgage to pay. Yeah, but you've been stuck there for fucking 20 years. You've been stuck in the same place, around the same people, the same fucking annoying uh, neighbors with a fucking rooster. 
living your pornography life? When are you going to wake up and decide, I've been sold a story that no longer serves me? And my last mastermind I went to, somebody said, let me give you your last tip. We are living in a socially induced hypnosis. We are living in a socially induced hypnosis. And I was like, what do you mean? He says everything people think and believe. Socially induced hypnosis. Mind control. Buy a mortgage. When you start to learn that a home mortgage was a way for banks to make money, you kind of go, what the fuck? When you realize that Social Security was a government taking your, taking your money from you, an interest-free loan for 45 years. When you realize that, that they keep you hooked to the desk by offering you benefits and healthcare and dental, and two weeks of paid vacation. And then you go, it's not really paid vacation. I've earned my PTO. Oh, you gotta use your PTO. I thought I was paid vacation. Well, that's what we mean. I mean, we can't pay. Like, wait, what? No. Socially induced hypnosis. I mean, every commercial you watch, what's the latest fashion? Socially induced hypnosis. What's the latest trend? What's the latest color combination? What's the latest pattern? What do you have to to wear, drive, what's the coolest, latest little gadget, thing, etc. Chips, food, fast food, doesn't that look delicious? No. Socially induced hypnosis. And now you're being socially induced to think that it's okay to be a size 12. Without understanding that today's size 12 was yesterday size 14. I mean, Erica today is a size zero. You know? But when she goes to an estate sale, she's like a size four or size six. She can't fit into, <laughs> they didn't have size zeros back then. <laughs> so a size zero today was a size four back in the day. Does that make sense? Oh, but I got into size 12 this year. Maybe you didn't lose, I don't understand. I didn't lose any weight, but I got into a smaller, I got into a size 12. Well, maybe because it was last year, size 14. Oh, fuck, Dr. V. That's depressing. No, what's really depressing is this chained life that we lead and the stories we tell. Who's gonna have the final word? Who is gonna have the final word on how you fucking live your life? My wishes and my prayers and my blessings is that you will. You will decide to have the final word on your life. Love you, see you tomorrow. Bye guys.